The Midnight Blues Chapter 1 Midnight The good ship Midnight cut its way through the waves like a surgeon's knife. Its jet black hull adorned with weathered carvings. Its dark sails a death shroud to those unfortunate enough to be the ship's prey. A storm lurked on the night's horizon. Flashes of lightning distant yet menacing. Fade Midnight stood at the door to the captain's cabin, his father's cabin. The young tiefling, fourteen years of age, paused before knocking, considering his approach. It would have to depend on his mood. Deep breath, knocked. Enter, the voice commanded. His father's cabin Located at the back of the ship was lined with trophies from nearly every place they had travelled. He sat behind a desk made from a carved giant's leg bone. The walls were lined with dancing fire silk. A rack housed the weapons of every captain the midnight had fought and defeated. Swords, spears, axes, spell-casting focuses, and even a severed hand in a warded jar from a monk captain. Bookshelves, lined with hundreds of volumes of various origins, made up one wall. Captain Rolf at midnight sat in his chair, which was, in truth, a throne stolen from a ship of an hour-long dead royal. His sapphire claymore blue lay across the desk, catching the candlelight. His tall and slender frame belied his whipcord muscles. His royal blue skin was marked by purple tattoos. And he was bedecked horn to toe with deep gold jewellery. His eyes, the colour of hot coals. Fade, come, take a seat. Fade sat in his normal chair, which his father had said had been carved from a dead treant. The others will be joining us soon. I sent Stoneheart to get the witch and Blackwater. How's your arm? Uh, it's fine, Captain. A little stiff. Lysandra, uh, um, Dado, I mean, said I was lucky it was a clean break. Made healing it a lot easier. Fade's arm, in fact, still ached like the hells. But his father did not need to know that. His crew always had to be ready for anything and never indisposed. When the break had happened two days before, during a sparring session with his father, Captain Rolfer had initially instructed the ship's barber surgeon to leave it broken for a while, so Fade could learn how to fight despite the break. But when Fade passed out from the pain, Captain Midnight relented. Yes, well, next time we spar, just expect to face more ranged attacks. You could have dodged that eldritch blast if you'd been paying attention. Yes, Captain. His father stood and walked over to the bookshelf to his left. Perhaps some book learning on the matter would help. Fade tensed. There was a knock at the door, the decisive knock of the quartermaster. Come in. Alison Stoneheart, quartermaster and second in command of the midnight, entered the room. Alicent was small, even for a dwarf, due to her gnomish ancestry. However, her presence was imposing, as she was almost as wide as she was tall, her broad shoulders housing thick muscles, her white blonde hair in contrast with her dark skin. She wore thick armour, as always, adding to her density. Throughout the years, Fade had heard many nicknames for Alicent, the Iron Maiden, the Cannonball, and the Bank Vault on Legs, to name only a few. A few paces behind her was the Navigator and third in command, Delias Blackwater, a half-elf with shoulder-length black hair and eyes as dark as the depths. He had the sort of face that made it hard to tell whether he was handsome or peculiar-looking. He was a druid and would often take to the seas and skies in various animal forms to aid in the navigation of the ship and would only reluctantly return to his regular form. 
The crew had often teased Elias that in a previous life, before joining the crew, that he had been the infamous man-eating hound of New Hampshire on the run from the law after a spree of murders. However, the rumour-mongering had slowed since Elias had confessed he had run away from his wife. Or, more accurately, wives. He was an odd choice for third in command, Thade had always thought. Sure, Stoneheart could capture the midnight, no doubt, but Delias, mm, his father knew best, though, as always. After Blackwater came the midnight's only true passenger and guest of the captain, Helen Bogdan Charmed. The witch entered the cabin, bedecked in a green silk dress that swished about her slender frame, a youthful and quite beautiful face framed by dark hair tied back in intricate knots. Her amber-coloured eyes made Fade feel uneasy. Please, sit down. The captain gestured towards the three chairs on the opposite side of his throne. Fade knew he had to stand. His chair was forfeited to any senior officer. Stoneheart, noticing Fade's lack of chair, offered up hers with a gesture. Fade, still tense, shook his head. Thanks, the first mate, with a smile. Stoneheart, before we begin, any word on that storm? Aye, still heading our way. Big one, too. Typhoon horror, I reckon. Crow seemed to think so, Delias said. Unnatural. We'll be within the Bay of Bones before it hits. Perhaps even at the flotilla. Fate permitting. The sea spirits may not be so kind to us, pruned Helen with a wry smile. The tides may be within your domain of spirits, Helen but they are also within the domain of mine. Captain Rolfer ran a finger along the flat edge of the claymore blue. The crystal of the blade began to hum as he did so. Quiet, Ogden Charms said, a flirtatious and devilish tone in her voice. Fade narrowed his eyes. On to the matter at hand then. Captain Rolf had cast a hand in a magical gesture. The shutters over the window slammed shut, the candles were extinguished, and the room was now only lit by the gentle blue glow emanating from the captain's sword. From its crystal depths, moving lights washed up the blade like rippling water. The flowing lights spilled over the boundary of the sword and leaked into the room, flowing down the desk and onto the floor like a projection of summer tides racing up the beach, until the whole cabin was consumed. The effect was like being a few feet under clear blue water on a hot day, pierced by sunbeams warping its domain. Rolfer stood, walking around his desk into the middle of the room. As you know, we've been following a ship called the Blackened Heart, which is nearly as formidable as the Midnight, from what I hear. A magical projection of the Blackened Heart shifted into the space like a trick of the light, held in midair. The ship was massive, nearly triple the size of the already large Midnight. Alicent narrowed her eyes at the behemoth, like a shark eyeing up a whale. The ship is also very elusive, seeming to disappear into thin air. Both Helen and Finister Bravier believe they use some sort of magic camouflage like we do. Blackwater with the help of Blue has confirmed that they are indeed heading towards the Bay of Bones. Captain Hollow Soul of the Crimson Creed says they are expected to parlay with the traders from House Samarin, which, as we know, the majority shareholders of the Fifth Pillar Trading Company. The mention of the FPTC made the room feel tense, like mentioning the bogeyman. The Fifth Pillar was the scourge of any pirate such as themselves. 
All of the wealth and military power of the Republic of the Garden, combined with the incredible mobility of an excellently trained and well-stocked merchant navy, made them the greatest threat to anyone who dared sail the tradeways. Delius, who rarely spoke in these meetings, suddenly blurted, Fifth pillar in the Bay of Bones. That cannot be allowed, they're the enemy. Why would anyone meet with them? Because Blackwater business is business, and Holosaw tells me he's arranged to meet to discuss a ransom. But Captain, wasn't it your mother who said, Kill every fifth pillar bastard who dared sail on my ocean? The mention of Fade's grandmother, the original Midnight, sometimes called the Midnight Lady or the Midnight Ghost. Her prowess for death dealing was unrivaled. She glided across the waves like they were made of glass. The blue at that time had manifested in the tip of her tail as a diamond dagger, ending the lives of countless of those who crossed her. She had a reputation for killing every crew member aboard a ship and sailing them back to the Bay of Bones, ready to be added to the flotilla. Much of the core construction of the floating city, the seat of power of the quarter bones, was made from these desolated ships. I'm aware of what my own mother said, Blackwater. I've killed my fair share and don't plan on letting the Zamorin go without consequence. But we will have to play this smart. They have wealth and power, and worse, they have the brains to know how to actually use it, unlike most of the aristocracy. So, what's the score, Captain? Delias murmured. Golds, gemstones, and more. Fade saw the look in his father's fiery eyes and felt a sense of emotion welling up in the captain. As quickly as the look crossed his face, it was gone. The crew of the Midnight knew not to press the issue. The unspoken question would remain unanswered for now. It was, however, Helen bogged and charmed that seemed to not get the silent consensus. Something very valuable, I hope, Ralpha. The captain shot her a look that made Fade's heart skip a beat. Not now. Later then, she crooned. It breaks the sheets. A metallic-sounding voice whispered in his mind. Out of my head, Hag! Fade barked. Every person in the captain's quarters turned to look at him, a mixture of surprise to shock on their faces. The most expressive and surprised face was that of Helen's, poised in mock shock like a copper piece actor. Enough, Fade, you will not interrupt, his father said making Fade sink back against the bookshelf. Helen smiled. The plan is as follows. I'll meet with Hollow Soul and attend the ransom exchange with him. Stoneheart, you'll accompany me. There's a key I will need, and Blue tells me it's somewhere on the person of the House Zamorin representative. Meanwhile, Helen will be accompanied by Blackwater and Finister Bravier as our main magic users. You'll quietly sneak aboard the Blackened Heart while its captain is ashore. There, you will steal as much as you can without raising an alarm. In particular, you will need to steal a warded adamantine box. The magical protection flickered and a box appeared floating in the room. It gave Fade a funny feeling looking at the box's sharp yet swirling filigree design, like a stormy sea. You get the box, I'll get the key. You make it sound so simple, Captain, remarked Stoneheart. It is if you stick to the plan, 
Helen will take down the magical defences, Blackwater will handle the crew, and Finister Bravier will open the vault. A vault? And a ship? The Blackened Heart is known for transporting valuable cargo. Its current cargo is no exception, but I trust that Finister Bravier will be able to crack it open. I'll summon the crew and go through the exact details before we get to the flotilla. For now, get some rest. I want my crew ready if that storm catches us. Dismissed. Captain. The crew chorused. Fade watched Helen flash a smile before seeing a flicker of emotion crest his father's face before subsiding. Another psychic message, Fade thought and cursed the hag under his breath. The gathered crew began to disperse, heading back to their posts. For a minute it seemed as if Helen, bogged and charmed, was going to stay. There was an unspoken exchange between the two, and Helen's amber eyes flashed for a moment. She turned on her heel, green silk dress flowing behind her like swamp water, and drifted out the room. A malevolent smile plastered over her face. Fade made to follow out. Fade, you wait here. I need to speak to you. There was something to his tone that made Fade feel instantaneously anxious. What had that hag Helen put in his head? The two waited until the footsteps of the crew had died away blending into the background of creaking wood and sloshing water. I'm going to need you on the job as well, Fade. Oh, um, uh, of course, Captain, you want me uh, with you for this meeting? No, I want you on the blackened heart. Fade's mouth went dry. His pulse quickened. Uh, stealing the, um, the, 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 the thing, the, the, the box? Don't act stupid. There's only one reason why like, you'd be on that ship. I don't give a shit about any of the other treasure. I need the box, and I need somebody I can trust to make sure the job is done. Despite the dread that was filling him, the idea that his father could actually trust him in a fight was a small burst of internal elation. Oh, of course, Captain, he said, smiling. That's why you'd have to wear the ring so Blue can have a good idea of what's going on and make sure the job is actually done. He felt the swell of pride beginning to form in him die like a seabird struck by lightning. Oh, yes, sir, uh, of course, Captain. The ring his father was referring to was the captain's signet ring, stamped with the family emblem, the ship at sea under a starry night, a deep abyss below. His father's ring normally acted as a way of bolstering the powers that Blue gave him. However, due to Fade's bloodline, when he was given the ring, he could access certain powers. This was the extent of the abilities that he had had access to from Blue. That was until his father would pass down the mantle of being Blue's vessel. His grandmother, the Midnight Ghost, had been the first keeper. Then his father, the Midnight Flame. And then one day on to fade, the Midnight... something. He was yet to the side. Although some of the less friendly crew members had often given him such names as the Midnight Midget, as suggested by Inga. Fade would quite often train with the ring on, granting him access to the ability to fly via beams of energy and all sorts of other magics that made Fade feel powerful for once. But his father insisted that he learn how to fight without the ring. So he had trained in spears and swords and pole arms and was quite an able fighter within himself when the need arose. But on those occasions where he'd been given the ring, he felt like a completely different person. As the awareness of the cosmic presence, a spirit of wind and stars and ocean deep and blue. The voice at the back of his head, reassuring, protective, 
guiding. Yet, sometimes Fade thought it guided his actions more than he realised. That the thrust of a spear or the casting of a spell felt automatic. It did make him wonder what effect it had on his father as the true keeper of the spirit. Captain, I, I don't mean to question you. Your judgment sounds like you're about to, Fade. No, I... Uh, it's just his father raised an eyebrow. I, I'm just not sure that I'm ready to take on such responsibility. I've already explained to you, Fade, that Blue will be the reason you're on that ship. I'd be on it myself, but I have a role to play and so do you. This is important to me, Fade. So important that I can't rely on just Blackwater and Phyllis de Bravier for this. What about Helen? The words slipped from his lips before he could stop himself. His father stood. You've made your feelings about Helen quite clear, Fade, and I encourage you to keep them to yourself. She is my guest, and she is one of the only people on this ship capable of getting you onto that vessel to do what I need. Captain Rother moved from behind his desk and strode towards Fade. The contents of that box mean a lot to me, Fade, more than you could ever imagine. I will not lose the opportunity to get it back, understood? Yes, Captain. Get it back thought. Captain Rolfer pulled the signet ring from his much scarred ring finger. Take this and get some practicing before we arrive at the bare bones. You will not disappoint me this time, Fade. Not with this. He took the ring out of his father's hand and turned to leave. Yes, Captain, I won't let you down. Made it to the door, his hand pressing against it before he realised his mistake. But it was too late. He span on the spot, turning to face his father just as the hardback book struck him on the bridge of the nose. Pain detonated across Fade's face. Dazed, he collapsed, clutching his bleeding nose. As he looked to the deck below him, he could see the book that his father had thrown now laying the name of the book embossed on its spine. Politeness and pirates. A Guide to Etiquette Among the Bay of Bones by Aurelia Aldelor. Take this book, Fade, his father slowly canted. You might learn some manners. Yes, Captain. Trying not to let the blood running down the back of his throat affect his speech too much. He waited, head bowed the word that he should have waited for before deciding to leave the captain's cabin. His father's cabin. Dismissed.